problems. OK. Uh, all right, so last class, we, we, we sort of rushed at the end, and we didn't get to this last piece. So I want to get through uh, how to deal with phantoms, isolation levels, and then we'll jump into um, the MVCC, a multi-version concurrent control. So recall last class that I mentioned at the end that like all of the examples, when we talked about 2PL, and we talked about OCC and basic timestamp ordering, all of these were assuming that the database was fixed in size, meaning we were only doing reads and we are only doing updates. We weren't doing inserts. We weren't doing deletes. Uh, if we have to handle these now, the data is changing. Uh, we can have a problem like this. So, assuming we're saying we're running under 2PL or OCC, it doesn't matter, um, and that we're running this uh, in and trying to run this with, with uh, full sterilizability. Uh, we have the example here. It's the same queries setup I had before. I changed it from max to count, uh, where I do a select beginning to select count on the age. Say there's 99 people. In, in the table to start with. I just plug this in. Um, then now there's a context switch. T2 then runs. They do an update to uh, the table, insert a new record. But then now when I run this again, now I get a different count. Right? Now, we said, of course, we, we could lock the entire table, and that would avoid this problem. But you know, if you have a billion tuples, are you really going to lock the entire table? Are you, you going to lock you know, one billion rows just to insert one thing? Right, no practical system could do this, right? Right. So the reason why this is happening is because if we just assume it's two-phase locking, uh, that it, with uh, with T1 in my example, it can only lock things that exist, right? Again, knowing the, knowing the, the coarse grain table lock. So it only locked the existing rows, got the share lock of them as I read them, and that didn't prevent the other transaction from inserting a new row. So then now when I when I come back and run the query again. That, uh, now I get a different result, which would not happen if they were running in serial order, uh, which is said was what we want to try to achieve. And so this is known as the phantom problem, right? The idea that tuples can appear and uh, appear and disappear, like a ghost or a phantom or apparition, uh, while my transaction is running, and the basic two-phase locking protocol stuff and the OCC is not going to handle this. So there's three ways to handle this. Uh, and so the spoiler would be, this is, this is probably the most, this is the most common one. Uh, for MVCC, it's a whole different beast. We'll, we won't discuss in this class. We'll talk in the advanced class. But index locking is what most of the sort of traditional systems will do. Predicate locking only lists, exists in the literature. There's one system that does an approximation to this. This is actually, the, the, this would be ideal, but this is like a, a unicorn. It's very difficult to do. And then the top one is re-execute scans. It's the simplest one. And you only typically see this in, in memory systems because you don't have to read from disk again. So we'll go through these one by one and just sort of see how each of these approaches would solve this problem. So the first approach is do re-execute scans. Basically, while my queries are running, I keep track of my where clause. And I keep track of not necessarily the read-write set. Well, I check the read-write set uh, of anything I read even though or scan even though I may be doing update. So what I mean by that is uh, I can have an update query, and all I need to track is what things I saw in my where clause, and maybe not necessarily what things I actually I ended up updating. So then now when I, my query commits, uh, or sorry, my transaction commits, the database system is going to go look at what was the scan portion of each of the queries that I ran during this transaction, and I'm just going to run them again and then see whether I get back the same result the second time. If I do, then I know there's no phantom. Right? There's nothing that between the time I ran the query the first time and the time I go to commit, nothing didn't magically appear or disappear. So I know that I'm running in, uh, uh, in serializable uh, ordering. Right? Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And again, this is, this is, I don't know, well, there are some systems like DynamoDB and Fauna could do this where you, again, do this reconnaissance transactions where you run the transac transaction once, run all the queries. Keep track of the read-write set, and then you go to commit, and then you actually check to see whether you get the same result. Uh, Hackathon does this, which is an in-memory engine for SQL Server. But mo most, most systems don't do this because the scan set could be really big, and therefore, if I had to swap things out on the disk, I'm basically running, it's, it's doubling the cost of every query. All right. The next one is predicate locking. So this is the original locking scheme approach that IBM uh, uh, invented for system R back in the 1970s. And the way they think about this is it's not actually taking physical locks on actual tuples or objects in the database. It's more this notion of a logical lock, 
where I had this multi-dimensional space to say, here's all the possible values I could have for every attribute in my table. And I sort of, what's a multi-dimensional, uh, uh, not a polygon, but like a, a region within that space that corresponds to a, my query. And then I just check to see whether there's another multi-dimensional space from another, another query or another transaction that intersects in any way with, with mine. So again, this was never actually implemented uh, in practice. There is a academic system called Hyper. Well, it's, it was academic by the Germans, and then it got bought by Tableau, and got bought by Salesforce. Uh, so it's a real system. But they use something called precision locking, which is a, a it's an approximation of this predicate locking, but it does it just for, uh, it only really works for in-memory systems. But we'll cover this in the advanced class, not here. The basic idea is this, right? So here's our two queries we had before. The select count on the select count on the age, and then somebody inserting things. So without actually even running the query, I could just say, all right, for based on this where clause here, here's this region. Uh, it's, you know, it's for, so for simplicity reasons, it's, it's a two-dimensional projection. Um, but here's this region that corresponds to this where clause with status equals lit. And then for this other one, here's here's the insert query. Here's the region that corresponds to where age equals 30 and status equals lit. And so I would know that if there's, a, if there's an intersection of these, these regions overlap, therefore I would know that they, have a, they would have a conflict. And therefore, I, would, I could be able to reason about which of these two is allowed to proceed, which one has to block. Right? Simple where calls with one predicate, yeah, you can kind of figure this out. But again, think of like really complex queries with uh, you know, nested queries and joins. It's kind of impossible to, or it's not really tractable to, to do this in real time. So this is why nobody actually does this approach. The one that's more common is index locking schemes. All right, and then there's basically four approaches, approaches that I'll talk about. And I'll just go to at a high level what these are, and just you'll see how we can then use basically the indexes that you guys built for in, in Project 2, plus the lock manager that you built in, lock in, in Project 4. The combination of these two things can actually help you achieve uh, serializability with, with avoiding phantoms. All right, so the basic idea is that with key value locks is that we're going to lock a single value in, in the index. Um, and what this is going to allow us to do is now it's to take sort of virtual locks for keys that don't actually exist yet. That's the basic idea here. And then we would know that if people are then scanning uh, along different you know, regions of data and someone's trying to insert into those regions, even though a value may not exist, the region would be protected by one of these index locks, and then we could block and avoid uh, having phantoms. All right, so we have a real simple, like, simple key value lock here to say, okay, I'm locking exactly uh, you know, key, key equals 14 in my B plus tree. Um, and you wouldn't actually store this in the index itself. You would store this in your lock manager. It would know that you're, you're storing something in the lock manager that corresponds to a key uh, at a specific location. And it would, it's a, sort of a logical concept. And so it wouldn't necessarily say, it's not like a latch you would store in the page in the B plus tree, right? Because when you go to commit and you have to unlock things, you don't know where that, where that page is going to be because that, that lock could have gotten moved around. So this is a logical thing. You know how to go to the lock manager and find this. I can also do gap locks, and this will handle, uh, again, non-existent keys uh, and ranges. Right? So say this is my leaf, uh, my leaf node. So I have 10, 12, 14, 16. So I can have a value in between 10 and 12 and 14, 12 and 14 and so forth. So I can take a lock here uh, where I want 14 to 16 exclusive, and this will prevent anybody from inserting something uh, right in this range here. Right. Key range locks is sort of the combination of all these. Where now we can take within a single lock request, we can take an actual key and uh, or multiple keys and and multiple ranges at, at the same time. Right. So we can take a lock like this, where you can say, I want the next key from 14 uh, inclusive up to 16 exclusive, and that'll cover anything at 14 exactly, and then anything comes after that. So that would be called a next key lock, or you can take a prior key lock. We would say, I want 12, uh, sorry, 14 inclusive and then uh, 12 exclusive. So you get everything within this range here. So you, you, you typically only take the locks in one direction. So you could either take, you only take only prior key locks, or you only take next key locks. You don't want to mix them because you have deadlocks. Yes? Uh, this kind of range lock can prevent a phantom problem if the new guy is trying to insert into the existing key. So if it's existing at the very beginning or very last, and you have to lock into the so the statement is, um, 
this this would work if you are uh, if you're trying to if, if someone's trying to modify something within a specific range. Uh, but if you if someone could be at the very end and the very beginning at the same time, they have to lock the whole thing. Like, yes, it's unavoidable. Yeah. Yes. His question is, what is the gap? It's, it's, it's not that anybody deleted. It's just something doesn't exist. Okay. So in this case here, I have the prior key lock from 12 to 14, 12 exclusive, 14 inclusive. That means that I, I by quiet this gap lock here, then I handle 12.1, 12.2, 12.3, right? Anything greater than 12, if it gets inserted, will be covered by this lock. Okay. Yeah. Just future insertions would be locked. So, same as future insertions would be locked, yes. All right, so now we can, we, can, we can combine all of this and apply the actually hierarchical locking technique that we talked about under 2PL, uh, where we can take uh, intention locks on wider ranges uh, and then get more narrow, get uh, more, more fine grained locks that are at a higher level as we go down. So in this case here, we could take a uh, range lock or intention exclusive lock on this range here, and then an exclusive lock for this range here. Uh, and then maybe just for this one as well, we can take exclusive lock on a, on a single key, right? And it's, it's all the same stuff, stuff we talked about before, where these, these are these essentially hints up above to say, here's what's happening within these range of values, apply in this case here. All right, so that's basically how index locking works. And again, it, it, it's, it's a weird concept because it's, it's like, even though we're relying on the index to tell us that these, these, how to apply these locks, it's more of a logical thing to saying, here's the range of values that we're protecting. Whereas in 2PL, we were protecting like physical things, like physical tuples, physical pages, physical tables, right? But it's unavoidable because again, the, the, my, in the case of my phantom, the, the, the predicate is essentially what, the logical predicate is essentially telling us where we would have the, the conflict and we need a notion of, or something in the system to be able to protect ourselves from this. Yes. Your statement is, uh, this will only work if you're deleting or inserting and you actually have to change the index. Uh, yes, because think about it. If, if, the, if the where clause uh, does not account for, like, if the where clause for the one transaction that, that could experience a phantom doesn't actually scan something, uh, or just, you know, scans, do a lookup that would then be affected by whatever the modification was that's creating the phantom, then then yeah, you, have, you would have to use the index. Yes? Why do you have to use an index for that in the first place? Like, can you just imagine you have like a higher level abstraction that just says like a range of values? Yeah, like so his statement is why do we need even index for this? Why not just have a, a higher range of values? I mean, that's essentially what the, the predicate locks are doing. Yeah. Um, so to go back to the example that essentially where you had a bigger inclusive and maybe a transitable and an insert at the same time, um, which of these do you all of these seem like you know, a billion losses and which of these is a lock index or a gap and it doesn't seem better than taking it over lock. So the statement is um, so for my example here, uh, which approach would actually would be better? This is where the index would help, right? So if I have an index in this case on a status, then like I could take the range lock, uh, right? You take the key value lock on, on status. And I they wouldn't have to take the individual locks for uh, or I would take the individual key value lock on status equals lit, and that would prevent anybody from inserting something that would have the same status that co would cause a conflict, right? Um, in practice, the way to think about this is like, oh, okay, does that mean I need an index for every possible column? Because I, I never know when these, the, you know, when, when these conflicts could occur. Most of the columns in, in, in tables, like for OLTV workloads, you're not actually using them for lookups and where clauses. Like I, I could have a hundred row or sorry, hundred columns in my table, and I, I would use a subset of them actually for my where clauses, right? Like I, I want to get your data out, but I don't need how to say this. If I'm looking at for your your account record, uh, you know, you on Amazon, I wouldn't want to look up like your 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 zip code or your city necessarily. I want to look up your account ID. So the where clause would have the account ID. So I just, I would just need to index and to protect that you know for that those lookups. Okay. So,
this digit represent to, so related to his question, like this seems all super expensive to do, and it is, right? And I sort of said at the beginning when we started talking about current control, uh, I'm going to teach you guys serializability because that's the, that's sort of again the gold standard protection you you want to have in a database system when you're doing transactions. Uh, but I might have, I might have already said this or before. Most systems don't implement serializability by default. Some systems don't actually e e implement serializability at all. Oracle doesn't do that, right? But Oracle's the they made more money than, than every database in the world combined, probably, right? So how, so why why is this okay? Well, because for a, a lot of times people are not willing to pay the performance penalty uh, for for something that's kind of hard to understand and reason about, like the correctness of of transactions. Um, and so by default, most systems are going to have not serializability, but a, but a lower level of consistency, a lower level of isolation. And they're going to choose this because to do this because you're, you're going to get better performance. And if you really care about protecting your data and, and avoiding race conditions and all these other problems that we've talked about, these, these anomalies, then you, you jack up your, your, your isolation level to go to serializable if, if your system supports it. So this is what the isolation levels are going to do for us in a, in a database system. We're going to be able to con control to, to what extent will a transaction incur anomalies or problems from other transactions running at the same time. Again, if I'm only executing maybe one transaction a second, the isolation level doesn't mean anything because no other transaction is running at the same time, and therefore I, sh I won't see another anomaly. But in a highly concurrent system with a lot of active transactions, then the likelihood that you could be exposed to one of the anomalies that we've talked about before could go up. Right? And again, so in exchange for not seeing these problems, you pay a performance cost. Right? So these are the, the, the basic anomalies we've seen up before. There's actually a fourth one we'll talk about in a second. Right, so the, the ANSI standard for SQL specifies four isolation levels. Um, and exactly how the different database systems are going to implement these things is going to vary widely. Um, like in Postgres, you say you want to run read not committed, which is the lowest isolation level. They actually don't support that, right? Because they're going to be doing this MVCC stuff, and they would actually have to do more work to make you do, be able to do this. So they just don't do it, right? So the, going from top to bottom, like this is going from the least amount of protection to the, the most amount of protection. So read uncommitted basically says all the anomalies, the dirty reads, the phantoms, the unrepeatable reads, these could happen, potentially. Uh, read uncommitted, which is usually default for a lot of systems, is where you'll be susceptible to uh, phantoms and unre unrepeatable reads, but you won't read uncommitted data. Repeatable reads uh, gets rid of the unrepeatable reads, uh, obviously, and then, but you still may have phantoms, and then serializability means the no, no phantoms, no data reads, and all, all reads are repeatable. Yes? How about the loss write problem? Uh, the loss write problem? Uh, uh, that comes under, um, that would, you would not be exposed to any of these, because the, that's, that's dealing with the cascading aborts. So if you allow for, read and committed would actually would, ha would have this, potentially. I should not take that back. Sorry. For lost updates, the if under, under two phase locking, if someone holds the right lock uh, for for a, an object, I can't overwrite it. Yeah. So again, like we'll see what the we won't do benchmarks here, but in practice, of course, obviously, they, I just talk about all this index locking stuff. That's not cheap, and so a lot of people probably don't need that protection. But trust me, there are cases where you do want it, uh, and this actually came out in the news yesterday. Uh, so there's this guy who just got busted for hacking $3.33 billion in, in Bitcoin back in 2012. If you go read this, the, the actual attack is pretty, pretty, I mean, it's pretty simple because the, whatever the exchange they were using on the Silk Road apparently wasn't using transactions. So he would just issue uh, like 200 uh, withdrawal requests at the exact same time. And the logic on the web server was basically the, that, that debit credit thing I showed before. Check whether your account has this amount. If yes, then let you withdraw it. So he would run these at the exact same time. It wasn't in the context of a transaction, or they wasn't running with uh, you know, full protection. And so the all 200 transactions, or how many ran at the same time, would all check, does this person have this amount? If yes, then, then withdraw. So they'd all withdraw at the same time, and he bled them dry. right? And they finally caught him 10 years later. Um, 
So there's a lot of examples. This, this is just, there's a couple other Bitcoin examples where like crappy websites weren't, weren't using transactions and they got lit up. Sorry, so she, she was stealing from Silk Road? Yes. Uh, uh, the feds don't mess around, right? Like, so even. But is it stealing? Is it, is it just like. Wait, is, is Silk Road illegal? No. Can you, do, can you do illegal things on it? Yes. I thought Silk Road was illegal. Uh, I think if you sell drugs on it, yes. Yeah. The, actually, no, they took that guy down too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> take that back. Um, whatever. This, this dude, he stole. It wasn't worth $3 billion when he stole it. It's worth $3 billion now. Because it was fifty thousand bitcoins, uh, he's going. He's going. He's going to jail. Okay. Did, more of the story is use transactions. Trust me. All right. So this is another chart again of, of the of the four isolation levels. All right. Again, read uncommitted. It's not yes, it will happen for these things. It's maybe because it depends on what other transactions are running at the same time and what are they doing and what are you doing. Right. But at least for if you go up to serializability, the the system should in theory guarantee that you don't have any of these anomalies. Yes. Uh, what's an example of unrepeatable read if it's not phantom? This question is, what's an example of an unrepeatable read but not a phantom? Uh, so you would have like read read an object. Uh, the, the phantoms are the ranges, right? So if I read an object once, read it again a second time, I get it back a different value. That's unrepeatable read. A phantom would be like I scan a bunch of data and there's things that. I scan it the second time, and there's things that I didn't see before that now appear, or things that I did see that disappear. Right? All right, so the way you would actually implement these is for serializable, it's two phase locking, or strict two phase locking that we talked about before, or st strong strict, uh, plus the index locks, and you acquire, and you, and you, you know, you acquire all the locks first. Uh, repeat or reads, basically the same thing, but without the index locks. Uh, read committed is the same thing, but as above, but like, as soon as I get a shared lock I re I, and I read my object, I release it, right? Because then come back in again and get another shared lock, uh, the, the, the value might have changed. And then read uncommitted, if you support it, basically does, does, does all the above. So on, on, um, on P4, we will, we will lay out exactly for the different isolation levels you have to support what, what is the protocol for how you acquire and release locks. Yes? Uh, so your question is, for index locks, why aren't we doing crabbing when you lock the root? So like, uh, if you lock, if you want to do a range lock, you could just lock sub root, and then you don't even have to do all the because no other lock would be, like, no other thing will be able to acquire that range. Because like, the root of a sub tree already represents I see what you're saying. So he's basically saying, like, why do I have to do the, the index locking on the values of the leaf node? Why not do something on the inner nodes? The problem is, though, with B plus trees, assuming it's a B plus tree, not, not a hash or whatever, uh, with B plus trees, the, the keys that are in the inner nodes may not actually exist. You, I guess you, you get the ranges, though, so that would, that would still be correct. They might be overly, like, too coarse grained, and that's why you wouldn't do that. Yeah. I, I, actually don't, I, I don't know the answer. Okay. All right. Uh, right, so quickly, here's how you, you can set them. And I showed examples where Postgres and MySQL, MySQL, you, you set the isolation level four. Postgres, you set it when you call begin. Um, and again, not all the systems support all these isolation levels. I just want to show this quickly here. So this is uh, sort of a table that I've been maintaining for a couple of years now based on something that Peter Bayless, a PHP professor at Stanford, put together in a blog article. But basically, here's the default isolation level for a bunch of these different systems. Uh, and then here's the maximum they support. So to point out right here for SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, these are like the you know the some of the four most top popular you know relational database systems in the world, um, and and except for MySQL, they're all running with read committed, which is the second lowest isolation level, right? MySQL actually gives you repeatable reads. Um, now Oracle has this thing called snapshot isolation, which we'll talk about in a second. So they don't even support serializable. Snapshot isolation is one tick below serializable, but again, if you ask for serializable, you actually get this, and, and, every, and like. You're just, you're just supposed to know this or read the documentation in, for Oracle. For, uh, for Ingress, CockroachDB, and VoltDB, they all give you serializable default, which is kind of nice. Um, for Google Spanner, they have strong serializable or also uh, 
external consistency. Basically, this means that you get serializable plus the order that the transactions are submitted to the system is the order that they will commit. Again, serializable allows you to, to swap the order. Like I, I, T1 could come, show up first, but it, it'll get committed after T2. Strong serializable prevents that. And Oracle claims they need this for, or sorry, Google claims they need this for AdWords for some reason. Uh, it, so his question is, is it also called linearizable? Uh, yes, yeah, so linearizable usually deals with objects on a single box. Okay. Like, I don't get it. That's a whole other uh, rabbit hole. Uh, there's a notion of like concurrency and correctness for like in like the the OS world and then the Davis world, and like yes, things basically come to to the top and they'll they'll come in. Yes, I can. Yeah, that, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. We'll talk, we'll talk about linearizability and external consistency later. All right, and then last one for, for DB2, there's this thing cursor, cur, called cursor stability. I'm not gonna teach you what that is. DB2 is the only one that does it, uh, but it's, it's basically one tick below uh, repeat or read, which is here, right? So here's the, here's the basic same hierarchy, and it's going from the least amount of protection to the most amount of protection, to read uncommitted, recommitted, ignore the snapshot isolation path, then there's cursor stability, repeatable reads, and then serializable and strong serializable. Then snapshot isolation has a different anomaly that repeatable reads doesn't have, and, uh, but snapshot isolation will not be susceptible to, to phantoms. And then quickly, I, I ran a survey a few years ago. I gave a, a speech about like, we spent all this time in, in academia worrying about building database systems that are, that are serializable, but then when you act, act, actually ask people what they actually run, you see that serializable isn't uh, very popular. And instead, most people are running their transactions with read committed because that's the default. So again, like in some cases, th this is OK. Uh, but for if you really care about making th sure things happen in the right order, then you want to turn up your isolation level. Now the question is, OK, how do you actually know when you would have one of these anomalies? <coughs> this is unknown in research. Nobody, nobody, nobody knows how to detect when this actually happens. All right, any questions about this? Sorry, could, could, could be, sorry, could you yes. touch on what exactly is recommitted again? Like just like the question is, what is, what is recommitted? Um, sorry. So recommitted would be um, phantoms, phantoms and unrepeatable reads may happen. So recommitted is basically, I, I'm going to read something. I get the share lock on it, assuming I'm doing TPL. I read it. And then I immediately release the, the shared lock. And it violates 2PL, but again, if you, if you like, that's okay, because you're running at a lower isolation level. So now when I go back and read that object again, I get the shared lock again. In between that time, someone might have come and updated it, take exclusive lock, update it, committed, and release the exclusive lock, and, and would, have, would have changed it. Yes? Uh, so it's fundamentally, that's fine, even from a Chronix level. Because uh, like you wouldn't run into, you wouldn't even run into the bank account problem where you would lose money, right? It depends on the application lock, right? Like, yeah. I read something, release the lock. If if my bank account is this, you know, t you know take money out. Uh, so then I go back and do get exclusive lock on it, but in between, in between someone someone mucked around with it. Oh. Yeah. OK, so let's jump into now MVCC. So with multi-version concurrency control, the, the basic idea here is that the, the database system is going to maintain multiple physical versions for a single logical object in the database. And in practice, that logical object is going to be a tuple. But at a high level, it, it doesn't actually matter. Um, and so what's going to happen is when a transaction wants to write to an object, wants to update it, instead of just overwriting the, the, the current value, as we've, we've talked about so far, we're instead going to make a copy of, of, of the original value uh, and then update that. And what exactly that copy looks like and how we actually maintain the diff and so forth, that'll vary and we'll cover this. So then now when a transaction wants to read an object, it has to figure out what should be the, the, the version it should actually look at. And de it depends on what isolation level I'm running at. Uh, I may want to read whatever is just out there, whatever the latest version is. Or I may want to read only the version that existed at the time when my transaction started, or th that was committed by a transaction, transaction that was already committed by the time I, I started. 
right? And so we can combine this technique, this idea of multi-versioning, with both the pessimistic and optimistic recursive protocols, the OCC and the 2PL stuff we talked about before, all right? And this idea of multi-versioning sort of permeates all throughout the entire system. So this is an old idea. It goes back to the late 1970s. There was a PhD dissertation by somebody who, this is usually credited as the first, first implementation or description of MVCC, but it was an academic, a purely academic endeavor. Um, the first implementation of uh, MVCC was done at DEC, um, which doesn't exist anymore. They got bought by Compaq. Compaq got bought by HP. I think they killed everything off. Um, but the first implementation was this thing called RDB, VMS, and then Interbase. And then they were both written by this guy, Jim Starkey, who claimed to have invented blobs. Uh, he went off and founded NeoDB, which is another MVCC system. It's sort of a, a well-known, I mean, I'm going to say the Jeff Dean of databases in, in the 80s, but sort of. Um, and so Interbase still exists today. There is a commercial version of it, uh, but I think it sort of targets mobile, app, mobile phone applications. Um, but it was forked off and, and, and then open source this thing called Firebird. If you ever wonder why Firefox is called Firefox, because when they when they Netscape died, uh, they were originally called the new browser. The, the open source version was going to be called uh, I think Phoenix, like rising out of the ashes. They couldn't call it that because call it that because there was some other software called Phoenix. Then they were going to call it Firebird. Couldn't call it that because of this database system. So then that, they came up with Firefox, right? Um, RDB. So so Firebird is still around. Kind of think of like it's. It didn't take off like Postgres and MySQL, but it is an open source system that, that is actually maintained. Uh, again, Interbase is, is still exists, but it's a commercial product. RDB got bought by Oracle, I forget when. And then this is always the confusing part, of, confusing part about enterprise naming. Uh, there is Oracle, the company, and then there's Oracle, the database system, the relational database system that they started in the 1970s. Uh, but then Oracle also sells Oracle RDB, which is a relational database, which is, which is based on this RDB VMS. Right, so there's the Oracle Relational Database System, and then there's Oracle RDB, which is a relational database system. <laughs> Two separate products. But nobody, like this is legacy. No, nobody would run this anymore, right? All right, so the key idea we're going to get with MVCC is the writers are not going to block the readers, and the readers are not going to block the writers, right? So that means that I can read an object and, and take a shared lock on it, potentially, uh, and then Anybody that wants to come and update that, uh, that tuple and make a new version won't block on my shared lock because they can always create a new version. And likewise, if, I, if I'm a transaction that's updating the, the, the tuple, creating a new version, the readers can come along and read the older versions without any problems. Right? And the idea now is that the transactions are essentially going to be called, create or have sort of this virtual consistent snapshot of the database based on these version IDs. We'll talk about how we track them in a second. Uh, and I don't have to acquire locks on anything I need to read. I say I only want to read the versions of the database, the version of the database that existed at this timestamp, and I don't worry about what out what other people are reading and writing while I do this. The other advantage you get from MVCC is what are called time travel queries, uh, and this is actually one of the original things that Postgres sort of, sort of touted in the 1980s when, when they were first building it at Berkeley. Um, and the idea here is that if I don't do any garbage collection. And I don't clean up any versions. Uh, I can run queries on a snapshot of the database that existed at some point in time. So, re so, so right now, when I run my query uh, in Postgres, I would I would get whatever the latest version that that's visible to me. Um, but you could say I want to run this query on the database as it as it existed three weeks ago. All right, and you can go look at these versions. And say okay, what's go back in time and figure out what what should what should be the version of the tuple I need to look at, the state of the tuple I need to look at, three weeks ago. Um, Postgres doesn't support this by, by anymore by default. There's extensions to add this back. Basically, what happens in the 1990s when they started building the uh, the open source version of Postgres that everyone uses today, it was it was a fork of this this code at Berkeley. Um, they had to add back the vacuum or garbage collection because if you don't do garbage collection, you run out of disk space pretty quickly, right? So, and most people don't need this time travel feature. You do see it now in some of the newer systems that come out. They claim to support this. The cloud does make this easier. Um, I've not actually come across a lot of use cases for this, other than like regulatory reasons. Like the banks need to know what was my state of my database three weeks ago. Most people don't need this. All right, so let's look at an example. So we have transaction T1, T2. T1 is going to read A and then read again, read A again, and then T2 is going to write A. So the first thing to point out now in our 
in our database, we're now going to have this column called the, of the version. Uh, and so the you wouldn't actually store it exactly the way I'm showing here. Like you wouldn't have like a name like this. We're instead we're going to have these begin and end timestamps, and that's going to determine the visibility of this version, right? So for simplicity reasons, I'm saying you know for for PowerPoint demonstrations, uh, the version column just keep easier for you to keep track of things. All right. So these begin and end timestamps they're going to determine the 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 range or the lifetime of this this particular version. So at, at this very beginning, assume there was some transaction that inserted this record. They had timestamp zero. And then the end timestamp is, is infinity or, or, or nothing right now, null. And so that means that this is the latest version. Right? So if anybody comes along with, with a new transaction with a new timestamp, their timestamp would be greater than zero. And therefore, this, this version would be visible to them. All right, so T1 gets, gets, gets uh, timestamp 1, T2 gets, gets timestamps 2. So now when T1 wants to read A, we go look in our, in our database, our table, ignoring how we got here. It like, doesn't matter whether it's indexes or not. Just assume we got to this, this tuple. And we would look and say, is my timestamp less than, or sorry, my, is my timestamp greater than the begin timestamp? And uh, is, the, is the end timestamp null, meaning this is the latest version? If yes, then I can go ahead and read this. And unlike basic TO, I don't need to keep track of any read timestamps. And I don't need to make a copy of the thing I read into my private workspace, like at OCC. It's just in the global database. So it's basically the same thing as OCC, except without the private workspace, right? The, the database itself is, or the table itself, is the private workspace. I'm using these timestamps to figure out what, what I can see. All right, so now T2 wants to do a write on A. Uh, so this one here, instead of overwriting the, the existing tuple, I'm going to make a copy of it and call that version A1, set my begin timestamp to be this transaction's timestamp, timestamp 2, and then I'm going to update the end timestamp for the previous version to be 2. Right? So now, again, if anybody comes along with a timestamp less than 2, they would know that they, they need to read version A0 and not A1. Which now you may be asking, how am I going to know, like, you know, both these transactions are still running. How do I know uh, if I come up with timestamp 3, or a transaction with timestamp 3, that I should be reading uh, A0, A1, right? Because there's nothing in here that's telling me that this transaction has committed or not. It just says somebody created a new version. So there's additional metadata we can maintain, like, such, like a transaction state table that says, here's all the active transactions. Here's currently what their status is. And so I would know what's the, you know, if I wanted to go say, can I read this in the tuple? Can I, should I read this version of the tuple? I could do a lookup in here and say, is this transaction active or not? Right? That's one way to implement it. You could also implement a flag in the tuple itself to say, oh, by the way, this is the version. This version was created by a, a transaction that has not committed yet. And then when the transaction commits, you go back and flip that bit and all the versions that they created so that people can know, know, know to look this up. Postgres does it uh, the, in, the, in the tuple itself. Other systems maintain this, this state table. You know, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no meaningful difference. The concept is still the same. All right, so now I come back in T1. Uh, it does a read on A. And now at this point here, I'm going to read version 0 because my timestamp is 1. I, I, somehow I got to, to A0. I see that 1 is between 0 and 2 for the beginning and timestamp. So I know this is the version I should be reading and not, the, not A1 because this transaction is still active. So this avoids the repeatable read problem because I'll go back and read the same version that, that I read before right? because I have a consistent snapshot. Right? Yes? This question is, do you always create a new version when you update something? Yes, you have to. But where that version is and what that version is, there, there'll be three, three, three different ways to do that. We'll get to that. Yes? Um, if you are in the read it, and then T2 commits before the second read, that's fine. Say um, the A1 is finished and begin to end three. And then when you're in a thread one, you, the second time you read, would you be able to read A1 there? This question is, if I'm running read committed isolation mode, in my example here, if, if T2 committed and then T1 reads it again, would I see the version 0 or would I see version 1? If I'm running read committed, in Postgres, you would see, you would see version 1. So when you read, you're actually not only depending on the beginning timestamp of the transaction. You are also going to get the current 
Uh, your statement is when, sorry, when I'm reading, when my transaction is running, and not only do I have my timestamp I'm signed when I start, but also the timestamp of what, sorry, the, of the current timestamp? Yeah. Otherwise, how will you know if the A1 is... So, right, so, so the way to think about this is, depending what isolation mode I'm running at, that's going to determine what I can see over here, right? So if I'm running with full snaps on isolation, then I would not want to see anything that has a timestamp that's newer than my timestamp, even though that newer version might have been committed. Yes. So in this case, what, what happens if it's false two hundred time segments with two two point one one? Two one bytes are gone. So his question is, what would happen here if if I give T one timestamp two and then T two timestamp one uh, with the exact same ordering? Yeah. Uh, So, all right, so T1 starts, is it happening in the same physical order here or no? Okay, so T1 starts, uh, they do a read on A. Uh, T2 starts, they do a write on A. So again, I, I would not see, if I, this guy would not see this guy's, this guy would not see this guy's updates because its updates would happen uh, would be uncommitted by the time this guy reads it again. So we just have the A1 record is not being paid. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to do this in PowerPoint. Like at this point here is A1, which was written by T1. Is that not in the database? Or like, does this show up in the database after this write? Yeah, so. Yes. But what, what about the timestamp? Uh, what do you mean with the timestamp? Sorry. Yes. And uh, it has timestamp of ten and of two and and of infinity, right? So for this right here, it would have the t A one would have the timestamp of one to infinity. Yeah, so one to infinity. What about the second read for for right, so the second read again again, like if depending on what isolation level I'm running at, I can look at say either in a state table or in the header of the tuple, is this thing committed, yes or no? Or is it, is the transaction that created this version committed, yes or no? All right, let's look at another example here. All right, so T1 is going to do a read on A, write on A, then a read on A. T2 is going to read on A, and then a write on A. So we start off, do a read on A. We, so, we, so our timestamp is 1. A, A0's version is, is begin timestamp is 0 to infinity. So we can go ahead and read A0. Then, then I do a write. So again, I, I copy the version of the tuple, uh, tuple into to a new, to the, the A0 into a new version, A1. Do, apply the change there, update the timestamp now to be from 1 to infinity, then also update the end timestamp to the previous version to be 1. Do the context switch, T2 starts running, it does a read on A, its timestamp is 2. It's going to read version A0 because T1 has not committed yet. And again, either because it's in the state table or because it's in the header of the tuple. For our purposes here, it's in the state table. Then I do a write on A, and in this case here, I have to stall because I'm going to I essentially have to get another exclusive lock on the, on the new version, right? And I have to wait to see whether this guy commits or not. Uh, under snaps isolation, you would stall. I think under serializable, you would actually you would, you would have to abort, right? Then, uh, so T1 runs again, and it reads, and it would see the version that it wrote earlier, and we avoid, we avoid uh, unrepeatable read. Then it commits, and then I can unblock uh, this guy, and then create the new version. Yes? Question, what is the isolation level running in this example? Snaps isolation. Next slide. <laughs> okay. So again, when a transaction starts, we're going to see a consistent snapshot of the database that existed at the time the transaction starts. Uh, and this means that we're not going to have any torn writes from, from actor transactions, meaning we'll only see parts of their writes. We see all or nothing. Um, and then if two transactions try to update the same thing, we'll do a simple scheme of just the first writer wins. The, 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 the second one could stall, or we could just go ahead and kill it. Yes? Uh, in the previous slide, why did it have to stall? Why couldn't it have just created a new uh, version? So this question is, in my example here, why did this guy have to stall? Uh, why couldn't I just create a new version? Because we would, you'd have to basically do a write now onto this thing to point to, to tell it that here's the next version you should be looking at. 
There's actually metadata I'm not showing here about the pointer versions the, for the version chain. We'll, we'll see that next, coming up. Okay. So I've said that the, the having a consistent snapshot, you're guaranteed repeatable reads. Uh, you know, you're not going to read uncommitted data. Um, you can still have phantoms. We we, we can uh, ignore that for now. But the, there's another anomaly that can occur under under multi-versioning that you don't would have you don't have under uh, under TPL and, and other isolation levels or lower isolation levels, and that's called the right skew anomaly. And the way to think about this is through this visualization that uh, Jim Gray, the the guy that invented or invented two-phase locking uh, and won the Turing one in the '90s. Uh, this is sort of a metaphor he likes to use, and I, I always like to use it as well. All right, so say I have a database of, of marbles, and the marbles can either be black or white, right? And I have two transactions run at the exact same time, and they're going to change. The first transaction is going to change all the white marbles into black, and, and the second guy is going to change all the black marbles into white. So the way it would work is they would both first do a read on a consistent snapshot of the database under multi-versioning, and they would see the state of the database like this. But then they would go and update the corresponding tuples uh, that were, were black down here and white up here and flip them. And now they, they both think they've done what they're supposed to do. They have all the white marbles or all, all black marbles. But then when we write it back to the database, because we didn't take write locks on these guys down here, uh, there's no technically no conflict between the two transactions. And we end up with an you know, uh, incorrect state. Okay, full serialized full Yes, because serialized because serializable ser uh, serializable isolation would 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 be either be the all black or all white because it, that would be the equivalent to a serial ordering. So it'd either be T one runs and then T two runs or, or the reverse. Mm, yes. But like if you if the granularity of the transaction focuses on like the off half of the lower half, it's still a valid serialization. Uh, your statement is if the granularity of the transaction focuses on the lower half or the upper half, it's still what? Sorry. Uh, in my example here? No, yeah. this would not happen. Yeah, you can kind of just separate the serializable. What's that? No, sorry, sorry, the window. Okay, but, but the serializable order will be transaction one reads the bottom and then write the bottom. Transaction two reads the top and write the bottom. Oh, he's saying is the scope of it only affects, like, it's not change all white marbles, it's black, but change. But the transaction is change all. Like, change all the marbles from, from black to white or change all marbles from white to black. So they'd either be all white or all black. You wouldn't have mixed. But then in the hierarchy, uh, then like with intentional lock, would it choose Ignore, like just, do, just, just for multi-verging. Okay. Under, under, under snapshot isolation, this is what happened. If you take, again, if you start taking high core locks, then like you start getting closer, like you start doing the things to avoid this problem, and therefore it's serializable. But in like snapshot isolation, as I'm describing here, where, like, I show up and I have a consistent snapshot of the database based on my version. This would not happen. Yes. But wouldn't it be easy to like catch in the sense of like, um, is it just for like certain commands? Whereas like, like for example, in this situation, you're talking about change all, right? So would you be able to like kind of like in when you are um, checking the kinds of operations that you're doing, if it's like a change all, make it such that it's not like a you change the hashing method. Your question is, couldn't I detect based on what the command is or the SQL command that's showing up is, and then change my isolation level accordingly? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. You kind of have to, like, how to say this? It's basically like saying, I'm going to drive a car without the seatbelt, but if I'm, if I'm about to crash, <laughs> like, I'm going to quickly pull the seatbelt on. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Not exactly the same metaphor, but but it's basically what you're saying. All right. So the thing I want to point out as as we go along in the implementation of MVCC uh, is that this, is, despite the name being multi-version concurrency control, it's not just a protocol, right? It's a it's going to encompass a bunch of changes of how we're going to manage transactions and data all throughout the database system. And again, this is why I had to cover this at the end of the semester, or near the end of the semester, because a bunch of the things that, we're gonna, that we talked about before now get slightly affected and changed by, by handling multi-versions. And just to show you that this is you know, pretty widespread, pretty much every single database that's been invented in the last 20 years, with some rare exceptions if, if you're running like an embedded devices or like super high performance transactional work, uh, systems, 
everybody is pretty much running uh, some variant of multiversioning today. Yes. We'll take that one offline. OK. <laughs> Same question? OK. All right. So I mean, I, I don't think we're going to get through all of this, but let's, let's see how, how far we go. All right. So the first thing we, the first thing we got to deal with is what is the Kirchhoff protocol? And it's basically all the things that we talked about the last three lectures. So I can do multi-version 2PL. I can do multi-version OCC. I can do multi-version multi timestamp ordering. All of that still applies here. And you would take basically the you implicitly get shared locks because the because because of the versions, um, and then for exclusive locks, you know if you're going to write to something, you, you take an exclusive lock on the on the on, on the tuple, and then, then you're allowed to create the new version. And whether or not that exclusive lock exists in a, a lock table, or or you can put it in the header of the tuple itself, which which is what Postgres does. Again, the the basic idea is still the same. So we're not going to go through how you would actually apply 2PL and all these things to to multi-verging. Again, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just whatever you, whoever's going to write the latest version or who wants to create a new version has to go through, through, through these protocols. The tricky thing is how we actually want to store the versions. So the, in my examples before, I didn't show you how we got to the, to the different versions. I just said, hey, they, they were just in these tables. And somehow we knew we had to get to A0 or, or A1. In practice, what happens is that the database system is going to maintain a version chain for tuples. Uh, sort of think of this like, like a single direction linked list that's going to allow you to traverse the different versions of a tuple uh, and to find the version that, that your transaction needs to read, right? Um, basically, the the all the indexes will now point to what I'll call the head of the, the version chain, which either could be the oldest version or the newest version, and we'll, we'll describe that in a second. And then what the actual the version chain is pointing to will depend on on how you're implementing uh, the, the multi versioning. Right? So the three approaches to do, uh, to do append only, time travel, or delta storage. Uh, append only is what I've showed so far. You basically make a whole another copy of, of the tuple and write the new version. Time travel would put the, the, the older version in a separate table, like a separate physical table. And then delta storage is probably what you're most familiar with when you think of like something like git. It's like the diff that you store of, of, of the change, and you store that in a, in a special sp space for each table. So we'll go through these one by one, and we'll talk about the trade-offs of, of all of these. All right, so with the pen-only storage, it, there's a single table. Yes? Uh, so in between the three versions, can you have like a sort of pause, like let's say you append only the list of kids, and then you time travel, make it the oldest. So this question is, I'm laying out three approaches here. Are they mutually exclusive? Or could you have some kind of mixed scheme? You could have a mixed scheme, but now you're maintaining basically two different paths of code, and nobody would do that. It's a huge pain. But like, what if you're uh, adjusting for like the, comple uh, the memory, and you want to append till a certain stage and then move it back? Uh, I look. Uh, this is the right way to do this. Okay. The way Postgres does it is actually the worst way to do it. But it, it was the '80s, right? Uh, this is what you should be doing. It doesn't make sense to try these other ones. And the time travel one will show up because it's when people take a single version system and they, and they try to graft on multi-versioning okay. as an afterthought. That's what SQL Server does. All right, so append only, we have a single table. And every time I create a new version, I'm, I'm just going to insert like a, like a new tuple into the, to the table. And I update my version chain to keep track of things, right? And I'm showing this by this, this pointer column here. I'll also say, too, again, we're not in a real system. You wouldn't, you wouldn't actually maintain this, these version these version IDs. And I'm not, so, I'm not showing the beginning and end because I'm trying to make it fit and keep it simple in PowerPoint. Right, so say that I, I, I have a, an operation here that wants, wants to create a new version. Uh, so I would traverse the version change starting at A0. I follow the pointer that takes me to A1. And then I create a, a new version, first by copying the old version in and then overriding it with the, my new values. And then I go back and update the version chain pointer from the previous version to now point to my, my, my newer version here. So this is an example of we're going oldest and newest. So the index would point to A0 because that's the oldest version. And then my transaction would then tra traverse that version chain until it finds uh, the latest version that I'm allowed to see, you know, assuming, assuming it was A2. Yes? So here, like, are the values only appended once they're committed? Or is... The question is, are the values only appended once they're committed? No. So 
So this question is, now if I have a read and I want to read the previous A1, how would I go back to it? So the question is, why isn't there a pointer back the other direction? So again, as I was saying, so the version chain is from A0 to A1 to A2. So assume the index points to A1. Sorry, sorry, the index points to A0, the oldest version. Well, so if you want to read the latest value, it has to go all the way down? The question is, if I have to read the latest version, do I have to go all the way down? Yes, this is what Postgres does. There's pros and cons to these, right? What's, what's, a, what's a pro? Am I gonna, so, so what's a con? He already said it. You have to go all the way down. What's a pro? He says it's simple. Yeah. Yes, but there's something else. <laughs> if I update the index and I create a new ver sorry, I update, I update a tuple, uh, and I create a new version here, I don't have to go update the indexes because they're always pointing to the latest version. So I have, if I have a thousand indexes and I insert into I insert a new version. I don't have to update a thousand indexes. If I'm always pointing to the newest one, then I got to update all the indexes to now point to the newest one. No free lunch. Yes. Uh, what's the B one here? Why there is nobody? Uh, so what's the B one here? Why like? Well, assume it's B zero, but like someone could have someone could have garbage collected B zero. It's yeah. I should. It's just B one doesn't need to be here. Just, just worry about the A's. Yes. So do we ever compact? Like do you? The question is, do you ever compact? Yes, we'll do a garbage collection vacuuming in a second. Yes. Uh, so his question is, if if we're here and A one's aborted. Yeah. Uh, so remember, what I said first writer wins. So at this point here, if a transaction is trying to update A and is able to get the exclusive lock to, to create a new version A two, that assumes that that means that the transaction that created A one is already committed. So we don't have to excise, we don't have to pull out single, you know, something in the middle of the version chain. We're just always appending. Yes? Did you update G chain? When or what? When. Uh, so here. Right? It's, it depends on what the version chain is. So if it's oldest and newest, then we just append versions at the, the end of the chain. Of course, that means now that I have to traverse the chain, which could be long, depending on how aggressive I am doing my, my compaction on garbage collection. Um, but I don't have to update the indexes because the index always, anytime I create a new version, because the index is always going to point to the oldest version, right? If I'm doing newest oldest, this will be faster if I'm always trying to find the latest version because I don't have to traverse a long version chain potentially. But again, that means that every time I update uh, the new version, I got to update all my indexes now to point to the new one. There'll be a trick the way we will we, we'll see a way we can avoid having to update all the indexes in MySQL. Um, but again, there's, you, you, you pay a penalty for ma ma maintaining larger values in your, in your secondary indexes than you would, you would normally otherwise have to do. So Postgres, as far as I know, might be the only one that does, does this. There was an attempt to, to get off of this and switch to like the MySQL Delta approach. Uh, I think it was called X heaps. That project might be dead. Uh, and this, is, this would be a very hard thing to change in Postgres right now, but it'd be nice if they could. But I would say, actually, regardless of whether you're doing, uh, well, if you're doing Delta storage, you would still, you would do newest to oldest. Uh, and then you still have this update the index problem. All right, time travel storage. Again, this is what I'm saying. This is, seems always, the systems that I know that do this, it's always like grafted on from a single version system to add a multi-version system. Like in SQL Server, you can pay an extra package to say, I want to do time travel queries. And this is essentially what, what you get. So the way this works is that the, you have a main table and the time travel table. So these would be like physically distinct two separate tables in, in the database system. And so every time I do an update, I'm just going to copy the current version uh, in the main table into the time travel table, update the version chain uh, to now point to the, the previous one that used to point at, and, I, and then I update this, uh, update the value over here with the new value, and then update its pointer to now point to the the, the the next oldest version or the previous version that I had in my in my main table here. So now, if I if I want to run what's the you know, what's the latest version of a of a tuple, if, it, if this thing only contains committed data, then I can just scan through this and not have to check any versioning things because I, I, I would always see the latest version right here. If I then need to say show me a version that that a previous version back in time, then I would follow the version chain to go to the time travel table and do lookups there. Yes. Like, 
could avoid those kind of situations if you actually find out about the like a space that's called a dash policy. So the statement is for news to audits, we could avoid updating the indexes by having a an intermediate pointer. Yeah. yeah we'll get to that. Nobody, nobody does that, but we'll get to that later. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, this seems kind of, the question is, like, oh, how is this any different than the append only? The difference is that there's two separate tables now that are physically distinct. You're not intermixing old versions within one, one table. So that means I could put maybe this table will be backed by a really fast disk, and then this time travel query where I don't care about archival data because like, I'm not going to read it that often, and it's not in the critical path of update transactions, I can maybe put some of this on a slower disk. Yes? Um, this is not specific to time travel storage, but when, when you add a new version, and at the same time you have an index on A, do you add a new entry in the B index tree? This question is, if I... Uh, when I have, how do I handle indexes with different versions? How, how do I handle index entries with different versions? We'll get to that later, yes. That's hard, too. OK. So the one that is more common in, in the research literature, at least definitely our experiments, showed that it is better, is to do delta storage. And the idea here is that every time I do an update, I'm only going to copy out the values that were modified in, in, in the update to this delta record that's stored in a, in a, in a separate table space. Uh, and so in this case here, if I'm going to update A1, uh, I'm going to put the old value as a diff in my, in my delta segment, then update the, the, update the actual main table data, and update the pointer now to point to the, the, the diff. So now if anybody wants to come along and read a previous version, uh, that's, you know, it's not the main, the, in the main table, they just follow along this pointer and then apply the diff to go back and say, what was the, what was the state of the tuple at this previous version? And I keep doing this, and I can maintain different, uh, uh, you know, uh, entire version chain of these diffs way back in time in the delta storage segment. So this is better because obviously, if I have a thousand attributes and I update one of them, I don't have to make an entire copy as in pendulum and time travel data, right? I just store a diff, and then it makes it really easy to do garbage collection. We'll see in a second because I just blow this thing away. Uh, like I figure out what's the latest version I can actually see and maybe just drop the whole thing because this is sort of be ordered in, in like in, in search and time. It's almost like it's basically the, the log structure stuff we talked about before. Okay, so any questions about delta storage, append only, and time travel? This delta storage is the one that you say that people are trying, like people are trying to like get to. Yes, there's been attempts to, yes. But this is what MySQL does. This is what Oracle does. This is what uh, CockroachDB sort of does. This. This is what pretty much. If you're going to implement MVC, you you would do it this way. All right. So we obviously have to deal with old versions, and we have to reclaim them because otherwise we're not out of space. As I said, Postgres had a problem. Um, so we're going to say that the data systems have to, has, has, has asked to have a way on the multi-versioning to figure out that what physical versions can be reclaimed from, from the database. And reclaimable would mean that there's no active transaction that can see a version uh, that, that, you know, that we see a particular version. If we know no transaction, we can ever see it. Even though, uh, sorry, if any transaction can see a, a version, meaning like their timestamp is within the range where this thing would actually, a version would actually be visible, we, we can't delete it because we don't know what's going to come, if it's going to try to read it uh, later on. So we have to basically maintain a watermark or threshold and say, here's the, here's the, 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 the minimum, tra minimum transaction ID of all action transactions. And anything that's not visible below that, we can go ahead and prove. Of course, the question is, how are we actually going to find these, these older versions? Uh, and then when do we know it's actually safe to reclaim them? Reclaim them safe to reclaim them is going to just through the transaction ID. But how to go find them and keep track of them is the hard part. So. Basically, this, this entire lecture is, here's approach one, here's approach two. I can't say which one is better other than delta storage. Uh, and various systems do a, do a bunch of different things. All right, so the first approach to do tuple-level tuple vacuuming or tuple-level garbage collection, and basically where the database system is not going to keep track of, for any individual transaction, here's, here's their, the, the versions that they, that they invalidated. Uh, we basically have a mechanism to start do searches to you know, on the tables to try to find the data we, we can reclaim, the versions we can reclaim. And then for transaction level garbage collection, 
where the JSON, every transaction is actually going to maintain their own uh, right set of the things that they invalidated, hand that off to some kind of background thread, and then it knows how to go find that data and, and remove them. All right, so the trade-off here is like, if it's transaction level, if I have to update a billion tuples, then I have to maintain a record that I've updated a billion tuples and hand that off to some kind of vacuum thread. In this case here, I could have hints for the, for the first approach that says, hey, here's maybe where you should go look for some versions that, that are invalid or, or reclaimable, uh, but it doesn't have to give precise locations. So, right, so tuple level GC. All right, so with two approaches, there's the background vacuuming and then the cooperative, uh, the cooperative vacuuming. So with background vacuuming is that we're going to have separate threads, separate workers that are periodically going to wake up uh, from sleep and start scanning tables and look for old versions. Again, there's this threshold that says, here's the, here's the, the, the smallest actual transaction timestamp. Anything less than that, you go ahead and it can reclaim. So in this case here, we have transaction T1 is running. Uh, it has timestamp ID of 12. This guy has timestamp of 25. So the vacuuming says, okay, what's the min of these guys? Uh, it's 12 is the smallest one, so anything less than 12 we can reclaim. So it literally is just going to do a sequential scan on the table, all right, and just look at look at the, the begin and end timestamps and say, is the, is the minimum transaction not within these ranges? If no, then we know it's, it's safe for us to go ahead and, and reclaim this. Yes, we have to update indexes, right? There's all the other stuff we talked about in a, in a second, like, but, you know, it's... it's uh, you're just, just literally just doing a brute force sequential scan to try to find things, right? This is a way oversimplification of how actually Postgres does it because I'm not, I'm not defining whether these versions are in the same page or not, right? Because versions could, for a single logical tuple, physical versions may, may span multiple pages. So I, may, I had to take locks on those things and try to find what's the beginning of them. Like it's, it's, it's way more complicated, but this is basically the high level of what it's doing. And obviously, this would be super expensive to do, to complete sequential scan every, every 60 seconds, uh, over and over again. So what you can basically mean to do is maintain a bitmap that says, here's all the pages that, that were modified. I don't know how they were modified, but we wrote something to them. And the last time I ran the vacuum, so that you can just scan through those, figure out what all the pages it needs to look at, and only examine those. Again, not entirely 100% uh, accurate, because again, the ver the the... The version that you may need, need to be able to prune may exist on a on another page, but at least you would know that a, a modification would, was made to some tuple here, and I could then do a lookup and say, well, what's the version chain to go find? Uh, trace, the, trace the version chain to find the thing I, I need to prune out. With, um, with cooperative cleaning, the idea is that as the worker threads are running queries, if they come across something that, that they know is reclaimable, that, that knows it and not visible to any transaction, and they're responsible for going in and cleaning this up, right? So say T1 does a lookup on, on, on some index. Uh, we're going oldest and newest. It ends at the beginning of this version chain here. And then it knows what the global minimum timestamp is. So as it scans along if, as, and it's reading the, you know, the beginning and timestamp of each version, because it has to figure out what it needs to read, if it sees something that knows it, it's not visible to not only itself, but anybody else, and go ahead and you know, delete things as it goes along, right? And obviously this means that you're gonna have to go update an index to, to potentially point to the new version. Um, but the idea is that instead of having dedicated threads that, that, are, that, are, that are crunching the background and do, trying to figure, you know, find the old versions, you just pay a little extra overhead when you actually do scans, uh, whether the reads or writes to update, to update things as you go along. Of course, now the problem with this approach of cooperative cleaning, like if I, make a bunch of old versions and I never go back and ever read that logical tuple again, it's never gonna get reclaimed. Uh, so you still need the background threads to occasionally go look around and try to find uh, reclaimed old versions. Um, but the idea is again, it's, it wouldn't have the same sort of overhead that you would, would have like a dedicated background thread. Yes? So here you, like, you assign the new task of the cleaning to the lowest active transaction. No, to be clear, so the statement is, uh, I'm not saying that this guy, because he has the lowest, he has the lowest timestamp, but he's responsible for cleaning. It's any thread has to do this cleaning. I'm just, I just drew the line for the first one. Could have been this one too. The, the, the point I was trying to make is that the system maintains what's the lowest transaction ID so that when, so, and everybody knows this, that when they scan, they see things that they know that's not visible to anybody else. They're responsible for cleaning things up as they go along. 
Yes. Why does it say only ultra-randomness? Why does it work? Sorry? Why does it work with ultra-randomness? So his question is, so I say here, it only works with oldest and newest because if it was newest to oldest, then I would never see old versions because I would follow the index and immediately land on the newest, newest version. Maybe I need like the second or third, third version down, but it, you know, I, in that case, if, if I'm seeing the second or third version down, then I might have the oldest timestamp, and I should be, in theory, potentially see the things, could, could see things in the future, so therefore I can't reclaim them. Okay, so the other one is transaction level GC, and as I said, this is just when the data system maintains for every transaction their own read and write set, and then when they commit or abort, they tell the, a, a dedicated vacuum thread, hey, by the way, here's the things that, that, I, that I know I invalidated. Your, your job is to go ahead and clean things up, right? So basically like this, my transaction T1 starts, begins at timestamp 10. I do an update on A, create a new version, uh, A3, and then I maintain my old version uh, uh, write set here to say, hey, by the way, I, I wrote A3, A2 was the previous version I just invalidated. So go clean it up if I, if I commit, right? I and mean, we just have a pointer to that, like a record ID. Then I do an update on B, same thing, create a new version, uh, and it goes to my write set here. Then now when I commit, I just pass this along to the vacuum thread. It knows that the timestamp uh, that would be visible, sorry, the timestamp that the timestamp that could see these changes has to be less than 10 because that was my begin timestamp. So therefore, uh, once I know there's no actual transaction with, with this that could actually see this, I'll go ahead and run and, and clean these things up. All right, so that's how you basically do your garbage collection. The, um, the example I said before about how my Siegel does garbage collection is basically works the same way. You're, you're pending these, these deltas with this delta segment, and you know what the timestamp is of, of each, each delta record. Uh, and if you order it then in, the, in that entry based on that, then I can just prune them out uh, by cutting off like the, you know, any portion of, of, the, of the file or segment that is, that is not visible, and I can just reclaim that memory entirely. You don't have to go looking, right? Because you know exactly where the old versions are. You, you most have to do this when you're actually doing a pen only. All right. The next tricky thing we got to deal with is indexes. So the primary key is always going to point to the head of the version chain, and which could be the oldest or the newest, depending on the implementation. Um, and when we actually have to go update the index, uh, or depends on, again, what the version chain ordering is. In most systems, if you update the primary key of a tuple, uh, that'll be treated as a complete delete, a delete followed by the insert. Because it's just it's too, too tricky to maintain, like, okay, here's, for this primary key, here's, here's a new primary key, and then here's the, here's the they're linked together logically, uh, and you know, here's, here's the pointers to, to, to them separately. If you change the primary key, the Davidson will treat that as a completely different logical, data, logical tuple, right? It's the secondary indexes that are more tricky, and that depends on how, again, what the version chain is and what the, what the, the uh, how we're actually storing the versions. And I think I mentioned this before. Uh, there's this blog article from 2016, six years ago, from Uber, where they talked about how they went from Postgres uh, to MySQL. And I said the true story is, is actually it was from MySQL to Postgres back to MySQL, because they hired some guy who's like, hey, it was really big on Postgres, which is, which is fine. But they didn't think through what they actually the workload is actually trying to do, uh, and they switched to Postgres. And the way Postgres does multi-versioning and how they handle updating indexes in multi-versioning is actually the worst case scenario for what Uber was trying to do. And they end up having to switch back to to MySQL. Right. So instead of paying, I'm sure these cost them millions of dollars to do this, they could have just got, given us the million dollars at CMU, and <laughs> we would have told them not to do this. Right. But I'd say this is a good example. Of like this is why you need to understand what, what's going inside database systems because. You can make costly mistakes like this. All right, so there's two ways to do this. And some of you have already mentioned a couple of these, uh, but we'll go through both of them. So for, first, is have a logical pointer. And this basically, this is a fixed identifier that doesn't change uh, for the physical version of the tuple. And this could be the primary key itself, or it could be a synthetic tuple ID, which is what he brought up, like basically an additional indirection layer. The alternative would be to do physical pointers where the, the, the index always points to whatever the head of the version chain is. So let's, there's pros and cons to all of these. So say we have a simple, simple database that's doing a pen-only newest to oldest version storage. So if I do a primary key lookup, like get A, then I would just, the, the, the primary key would have a record ID 
uh, that would point immediately to the head of the virgin chain. Right? That's fine. That's, that's fast. For a secondary index lookup, I could have a, a record ID as well and point to the head of the virgin chain. But of course, again, if I, if I update the, uh, if I, well, I, I, if I run the, I update a new version, then I got to update all these secondary indexes because they're pointing directly to it. Right? So if I have, again, a thousand indexes, they all have to update this thing, or point to this thing. So anytime I create a new version, I have to update all 1,000 indexes. Right? And this, this is what, uh, well, Postgres is doing oldest and newest, but uh, this is essentially what they do as well. The way my Siegel does this is that for secondary indexes is that the key, sorry, the value of the secondary index is actually the, the primary key itself. Right? And then the primary key then, I, I, so I do my secondary index lookup. I get the, the primary key as the result. Then I do another lookup in the, in the primary key index to then jump down to the, the virgin chain here. So now in this scenario, no matter time, how many times I update the virgin chain, uh, I only have to update the primary key index. All the secondary indexes don't have to change because the primary key doesn't change. Uh, and they can always find out what the right location of the virgin chain is by going to this. Right? And this is why I was saying before, this is why if you, if you update the primary key of a tuple, even though it sort of conceptually seems like it's the same thing, we have to treat it as a separate new logical tuple because we have to go update all these secondary indexes as well. And then the example that he brought up is, what if I had this like virtual tuple ID and some kind of mapping table that says, if I, t if I secondary index has this, this tuple ID, I do, do a second lookup in this tuple address, uh, lookup table, and then I get my, my head of my virgin chain here. You could do this. Nobody actually does this because now you're basically maintaining a second, another whole second index, and you might as well just use the primary key the way MySQL does. All right, so does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So the tricky thing is also going to be, although we have one minute left. Um, uh, what's that? He says, let's call it a day. You know, this is a lot. This is a lot. Yeah, yeah, let's call it a day, and then we'll do a demo with Postgres uh, to show how they do this next time, okay? Nice. All right, see you guys. Super snake.